are we ready to go? Great. Well, uh, good morning, everybody. I bid you both a happy West Virginia Day and happy Juneteenth. And I am to begin by announcing that this program is being recorded. My name is John Cuthbert. I'm director of the West Virginian Regional History Center. And it's my honor to welcome you to the History Center and WVU Libraries 2021 West Virginia Day celebration. A tradition that dates back to 1987, making this the 34th anniversary of the founding of this event, which of course celebrates the birthday of our state, which will turn 158 years old on Sunday, June 20th. Sunday. This is the second year our program is coming to you via Zoom rather than being an on-site event. And hopefully it will be the last, at least the last to be solely online. And I thank all of you uh, who are in attendance, especially on this brand new state holiday. I also want to say that despite the fact that we are meeting virtually today, the History Center is proceeding with our standard West Virginia Day elements, which include not only this speaker's forum, but also a theme exhibit and a West Virginia Day poster. The exhibit is currently under construction in the Center's Davis Family Galleries and will be open to all visitors when the center reopens to the public on August 2nd. I want to thank the several History Center staff who have contributed to the exhibit, including especially Lemley Mullet, our photos manager, and Catherine Rakowski, who has done a heroic job of identifying and reviewing archival resources for the exhibit. And of course, also Assistant Director Lori Hostutler, who is the exhibit coordinator. The poster, which you have hopefully seen on your screen, and I actually have one hanging on the wall behind me, was designed with the help of WVU graphic design graduate Kelly Barkhurst, and it's ready for distribution immediately to members of the WVU community who wish to come in and pick one up in person. And you can pick one up uh, at any time the library's open in the Rockefeller Gallery. And the poster will be available both there and here in the center to all others when the center reopens in August. But you don't have to wait until then. Uh, due to the present unique circumstances, we've decided that we will mail a poster at no cost to anyone who requests one. And you can take advantage of that offer by filling out a request form that now appears on the center's website. You can find that form on the West Virginia Day page, which you will find under the news and events tab on the center's homepage. Without further ado, I will turn the program over to Lori, who will introduce our first speaker. Thank you again. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's uh, wonderful to see you all this morning. Thank you so much uh, for joining us. Um, I did just drop the link um, to the West Virginia Day page into the chat, and um, there is a link on that page um, uh, where you can uh, fill out the form to request a poster. Um, also, we will have a, a question and answer session after uh, our speakers. Um, and if you think of a question during um, their talks, you can drop that in the chat and we'll go through those um, at the end and, um, and also take live questions at the end. Um, so without further ado, let me introduce our first speaker, um, uh, Dr. Uh, William Hal Gorby. Uh, Hal Gorby is an, a teaching assistant professor of history and director of undergraduate studies at West Virginia University. He teaches courses on West Virginia, Appalachian and American immigration history, and is the 2021 recipient of the Eberly College Outstanding Teacher Award. His book, Wheeling's Polonia, Reconstructing Polish Community in a West Virginia Steel Town, was published by WVU Press in May, 2020. He has also consulted on the research and script editing for the PBS American Experience documentary, The Mine Wars. 
In 2019, he researched, wrote, and hosted a podcast by Wheeling Heritage Media titled Henry, The Life and Times of Wheeling's Most Notorious Brewer, which won a History Hero Award from the West Virginia Department of Arts, Culture, and History in 2020. Take it away, Hal. Okay, I think we're good, possibly. Okay, all right. Give me a second here to share my screen. It's nice to be here with everyone, even though it's obviously in a remote format, but we make do with what we have. All right, um, well, thank you uh, for letting me uh, speak with all of you today. Um, I, I'm very interested uh, in what my fellow presenter is going to present as well. Um, but I wanted to sort of frame things initially around um, some of the broader themes that are factoring into the uh, mine war story, um, and particularly the, the miners' own motivations themselves. Um, and and the, some of this is obviously coming from letters and documents that miners themselves uh, wrote to political figures and to give you some sense of the justification for uh, the, the violence that often uh, often took place. Um, I, I'm having several people saying that there's a severe echo going on. I'm not sure if that's bad for everybody. My only advice is for, for everyone to please make sure that they're muted. We're trying to keep everyone um, muted. Um, it, it appears that it's limited to certain um, listeners, so I, I don't know that there's anything that we can do, but I do apologize. Uh, sometimes we get these weird affects on Zoom. <laughs> well, it is a, a, an issue of the technology. We're always tied to it too much now as things have gone. Um, by the summer of 1921, tensions were running high along the Tug River Valley, which had been a war zone for over a year. Soon armed miners would seek to liberate Logan and Mingo counties from rule by armed thugs in the employ of absentee capitalists. How could representative government allow these terrible conditions to exist? Uh, Governor Ephraim Morgan received many letters of protest that summer, like that from UMWA Local 3302 in Bower, West Virginia, in Braxton County. Their tone was quite blunt, criticizing, quote, the brutal system in force in Mingo, Logan, and McDowell counties has become a stench in the nostrils of all decent, right-minded, liberty-loving people and should cease, end quote. Their home state had sold, quote, <laughs> Okay, their home state had sold its souls to a group of brutal coal operators while tolerating a feudal industrial system. These miners desired a state government that would recognize, quote, workers' constitutional guarantees to exercise their freedom fully and freely. The struggle of the Southern West Virginia miners is crucial to West Virginia's history. The mine wars persisted in the Southern counties of the state from around 1902 until culminating in the Battle of Blair Mountain 100 years ago. Uh, these places are sites of some of the bloodiest labor battles in American history. Uh, but a big question people always have is why resort to violence? What, what was the willingness to resort to violence? And while, you know, historians have focused on a number of the elements, you know, private armed guards, the nature of the company town system, I want to focus on something that you see also throughout the, the various uh, incidents. Uh, it was something that we found in doing the research and the editing for the documentary film from PBS, is this growing concern about the collusion between the coal industry and the county and state government. Uh, suffering years of repression, miners began to frame their critiques increasingly to view the government uh, of the state as a sham on what representative government should be. Um, whenever martial law would be declared or the use of national guardsmen and state police, and collusion between political leaders and the industry. I hope that I can humanize some of the miners' demands, which 
Unfortunately, in the sources that mainly get used in terms of the press, newspapers at the time, this, these sort of demands and views of the miners were never uh, produced, never uh, sort of uh, provided to the wider public. Thus, by 1921, many miners believed that only through a violent march could they hope to redeem the state where mountaineers are supposedly always free. In April of 1912, we'll start with the first major strike on Pink Creek and Cabin Creek in Kanawha counties and going into Fayette County. In April of 1912, miners on Cabin Creek went out on strike and the operators promptly evicted them from their housing. Miners uh, set up tent colonies, uh, particularly near the town of Ex Eskdale. Uh, and the UMWA provided tents for uh, thousands of miners and their families. The coal operators following the tried and true practice hired over 300 Baldwin Feltz agents uh, who promptly set up machine gun positions, fences, uh, and uh, defensive works around the tenth colony. Violence erupted by uh, May and into June uh, with violence between armed miners and uh, Baldwin Feltz detectives. What initially began as a sort of limited strike in this particular region uh, and a critique of the Baldwin Guards more specifically, merged over time into a larger critique of the state government. With the aid of those like Fiery Mother Jones, as you see here, and local leader Frank Keeney, who we'll hear here a little bit more about here in the second presentation. On August 16, 1912, about 3,000 marchers held a rally on the steps of the state capitol, where Mother Jones basically read a riot act to uh, then Governor William uh, E. Glasscock. Uh, and I think her, uh, the key part of her speech is worth quoting, she said, quote, unless the governor rids Paint Creek and Cabin Creek of these goddamned Baldwin Felt mine guard thugs, there is going to be one hell of a lot of bloodletting in these hills, end quote. Other signs that day also spoke to this increasing politicized nature of the strike. Uh, some miners had signs that said, quote, Nero fiddled while Rome burned. That is what the governor of West Virginia is doing, end quote. Governor Glasscock began receiving criticism almost immediately. Roy Smith of Clarksburg noted that the state's motto, Montani Semper Liberi, was now, quote, a mockery. Uh, he was shocked that Glasscock knew nothing of the Baldwin Guards' treatment. Um, but Smith went further to stress that, quote, capitalists are writing on the wall the prophecy of their own doom. If the laboring people of Kanawha County get no relief at the hands of a Republican governor and a Democratic sheriff, they will bolt your ticket in November. He was referring to the growing support at the time for the Socialist Party, particularly in the strike zone. Socialists obviously advocated for a fair distribution of wealth and control uh, in the coal fields and, of course, the right of workers to form unions. Socialist leaders had formed town defenses in the strike zone and even led some armed patrols. Um, the party did extremely well, uh, winning 18% of the vote in Kanawha County's election that year and 14% nearby Fayette County. As time went on, another thing you see described is this idea of a coal dominated invisible government in West Virginia. Uh, numbers of people writing into the governor uh, brought up this sort of theme. Uh, C.H. Boswell, editor of the Charleston Labor Argus, uh, coined the term, noting that, quote, invisible government is responsible for many of the evils with which West Virginia is now afflicted, end quote. And again, this is to this more politicized role of, of how the miners are viewing what's going on. Uh, after reflecting on the issue, Governor Glasscock finally by September 3rd, se September 2nd, excuse me, uh, decided that a civil war had broken out 30 miles from Charleston. Uh, violence had been escalating, and on September 2nd, he declared the first of several declarations of martial law. He had actually considered it before. There's an amazing document in his papers from July 29th, where he wrote to the uh, colonel of the National Guard, enclosing a blank proclamation of martial law uh, with an order for the county sheriff to carry it out. Shockingly, the governor wanted no paper trail saying, quote, no record make of the issuance of this either in the Secretary of State's office or anywhere else, end quote. He had even asked his attorney general before this decision if the guardsmen would be allowed to escort minors bringing food to the strikers uh, because this might be interfering with company property. So a combination of weak leadership and decision uh, all allowed the tensions to continue to escalate. 1,200 National Guardsmen, uh, like those seen here, entered the coal fields and began disarming 
some of the, the, uh, the miners, obviously. Uh, but however, they grew even more angry as they saw that the guardsmen were protecting uh, strike breakers or scabs, as they were called, being brought in by the companies. The most egregious abuse of civil liberties happened as a result of martial law being declared. The military courts that were instituted under martial law led to a massive abuse of power. Uh, militiamen arrested minors in support of local officials on very loose charges and sent them to jail. Um, even when martial law was redeclared again in November of 1912 after strikers had begun shooting at CNO trains bringing in strike breakers, um, a state military commission tribunal was set up in the town of Pratt, um, where arrested individuals by the guard were brought before this uh, military style tribunal. Uh, they didn't have a lawyer present. They were uh, found guilty, usually quickly, and sentenced to prison sentences at the state penitentiary in Moundsville. Uh, this is a group of them seen here in their mugshots. Silas Frank Nance, who was a socialist marshal for the town of Estale, received five years in prison for interfering with a guard officer who was trying to arrest a striker. He had basically told the militia men to go to hell. Uh, and as he noted it later, he said, quote, I was arrested on a Tuesday, tried on a Wednesday, and sent to the Moundsville Penitentiary on a Thursday, end quote. Likewise, prominent African-American striker Don Fuclos Chain, who you can see on the bottom middle row here, uh, was found guilty of obstructing a train and sentenced to five years at Moundsville. Um, to legalize these actions, the martial law proclamation was made retroactive to cover any offenses committed prior to November 15th. Thus, the tribunal had wide latitude to impose stiffer penalties than uh, the local courts. Um, as you can probably imagine, uh, these decisions of the military tribunal violated the state and U.S. Constitution. Uh, no private citizen could be tried uh, for an offense that was not recognized by a civilian court when the civilian courts are still functioning. However, the state Supreme Court disagreed. Uh, Colonel George S. Wallace of the state militia was pleased with the decision, writing the governor, quote, if the Supreme Court declares a state a war and suspends the Constitution, then every act claimed by ourselves follows as a necessary conclusion, end quote. Wallace actually, actually drafted the legal briefs and it was he who actually encouraged uh, the mass publication of guard photographs like this one showing all of the arms collected uh, during the strike to sort of feed uh, uh, propaganda, we, should, we would call it. It's, it seems obvious why this view of, of the Myers that an invisible government exists uh, might where it may have come from. Now, obviously, as time moves on, you know, we know of key events like the Maitland Massacre and Shootout, uh, made famous uh, because of people like Sid Hatfield seen here. Uh, and of course, the brutal um, execution style murder of Hatfield and his friend Ed Chambers uh, in the lead up to the Battle of Blair Mountain. But I think it, we often neglect that sort of imperial, important point that happened between the Maitland Massacre in May of 1920 uh, and the uh, uh, murder of Hatfield on August 1st of 1921. Uh, it's during this period that you see a lot of the growing critiques the miners had about the undue influence of the state government and, and local, uh, local county government as well. One of the biggest complaints was over the use of the state police. Governor Ephraim Morgan became a key target of the miners' anger and they wrote to him in his papers or many, many letters. Uh, some on formal UMWA stationery, some scribbled, handwritten uh, on lo uh, just loose paper. Uh, and in particular, they called out this uh, abusive use of the state police, which had only been created a few years prior. In 1921, the state legislature had actually passed a law uh, significantly increasing the size of the police from 80 to about 200 troopers. Most of these men would quickly be sent to the Tug Valley. Uh, Morgan would eventually expand the number of state police in the area following uh, what was known as the Three Days Battle in mid 1920, uh, May 1921. Starting in a mine at Merrimack, uh, their leader, Captain James Brockus, noted thousands of rounds of bullets were fired from rifles and machine guns. In response, Morgan declared martial law on May 19, 1921. Uh, invoking the law allowed him to suspend the elected Mingo County Sheriff and place all law enforcement under the state police's control. 
He even went a step further issuing an executive order prohibiting all forms of free speech assembly and allowed the state police to hold civil citizens in jail for whatever reason. And most of the attention focused on uh, the Lick T Creek tent colony uh, where, where most of the striking miners uh, were located. The state police abused the broad powers they had. One eager trooper actually told a journalist, quote, the big advantage of this martial law is that if there's an agitator around, you can just stick him in jail and keep him there, end quote. Men were arrested on a variety of charges like bunching. Uh, basically, if the state police saw three men talking together, they could arrest them for trying to plot if they thought and then for a variety of reasons. Another miner was arrested for carrying the United Mine Workers Journal under his arm. Uh, Frank Ingham, a black uh, union leader, was arrested after several men followed him through the Lick Creek tent colony into the woods. Uh, Ingham was again accosted by state police when he went to uh, Nolan to pick up building supplies. Uh, while he sat in the rail station, he said a trooper, quote, laid down on the bench, laid his muddy boots across my leg, and he held the butt of his pistol and his blackjack in his hand, end quote. Another uh, a black striker, excuse me, George Eccles, told a congressional hearing, quote, you know our rights under the Constitution, that no man should be condemned or jailed until we have had a free and impartial trial. We claim to be citizens of the United States, and we ask for our rights of citizenship, end quote. And that's a common thing that you hear the miners voicing, uh, either if it's in congressional testimony or in some of these private letters that made their way uh, to the state government. Governor Morgan actually chastised uh, the state police. Uh, he told Major Thomas Davis that his troopers were not to interfere with those in the, the tent colony unless they were openly violating law and order. Uh, in his mind, he said they should be treated the same as, quote, those who lived in the most palatial residence in the county, end quote. Unfortunately, that's not what was happening. And tensions reached a breaking point on June the 14th, um, 100th anniversary of this just passed a few days ago. An incident after uh, some shooting from the hillsides uh, on some of the near the state police, a group of 70 state troopers uh, basically raided the tent colony. They ransacked tents. They went through families' belongings, tipped over cook stoves. Uh, one miner described kerosene was poured into uh, children's milk. Uh, they dumped clothes, they just ripped up the tents, ripped up uh, the, um, their beds and everything else. Over 40 uh, men were actually sent off to the county jail, as you can see here at gunpoint, uh, with never hearing any charges brought against them. The worst act came when uh, minor Alex Breedlove was pulled from a tent, uh, told to hold up his hands and was shot basically execution style. The attack shocked minors throughout the state. Uh, miners for local union 4172 out of Barber County called Morgan a hypocrite, asking, quote, what you would call the acts of your state constabulary who drove the women and children to the woods for shelter, end quote. Oh, this is a, you know, shows how dramatic the situation is. It's a little humorous as well, showing how the, uh, the police had cut up some of the uh, miners tents. By July, the miners were reaching a breaking point. Uh, the state power was constantly going to violate basic civil rights and come down virtually 100% of the time on the operator's side. Then the miners concluded more drastic political action was necessary. And this is seen and laid out in their letters. I mean, it's not just wild violence or irrational thought. I mean, it's very rational, maybe not grammatically or always spelled correctly. Uh, some Fayette County men told Frank Keeney in the letter went to the governor that they were fed up. They hoped that a new governor and state officials would end the inherited laws of medieval times when, quote, these are from minors, Saxon and Norman Earls administered direct justice direct with knotted clubs, cleavers and swords would be substituted by the Bill of Rights and the Constitution, end quote. Uh, they hoped that Keeney would help organize a constitutional league that would start a process to impeach Governor Morgan. Miners also criticized the open collusion that had gone on for years between local and county uh, coal operators and uh, county officials. Uh, this is a uh, case in point, of course, would be a place like Logan County, led at the time by Sheriff Don Chafin, who was often referred to as the czar of Logan County. Uh, former Governor John J. Cornwell responded to criticism by miners, uh, arguing that, quote, Logan County is a political unit self-governed, electing its own officers, uh, over whom I have no direct control, end quote. 
Uh, we know Logan County was one of the most, uh, the worst abuses in this regard. In 1919, uh, one report found that the Logan County Coal Operators Association paid an estimated $32,700 a year uh, to fund Sheriff Chafin's army of deputy sheriffs. According to journalist Arthur Gleason, quote, it is this exercise of public power under private pay uh, that was the worst of these abuses. And there's that army of paid deputies. <clears throat> Excuse me. Chafin's control of the county prevented union organizers from ending, but often could lead to attacks on innocent bystanders too. A traveling salesman wrote a testimonial to the governor sarcastic, sarcastically requesting a, a passport from the Tsar of Logan to go back to the county to uh, work with clients. Uh, while he had been there in January of 1920, he was stopped on the downtown Logan Street by the sheriff. Uh, when he tried to explain, uh, he noted that Chafin told him, quote, if I hear one word out of you, I will shoot your goddamn head off, end quote, and made him get on the next train. When the salesman asked if he was traveling in the U.S., Chafin retorted, quote, this is Logan, end quote. Miner's letters directly address this issue of constitutional rights, uh, repeating again and again statements like, quote, only asking for what the law of the state should be able to give them. We feel that all men have a perfect right to exercise freedom. My favorite, the statute books of the state of West Virginia provide that all men shall be free and equal. They used and built off that democratic language of the First World War um, and began to increasingly make more specific demands to, as the summer went on. Uh, local Union 1891 in Harrison County noted that Mingo County miners were on strike to, quote, secure their constitutional rights, and a martial law directly violated citizens' freedom. Uh, and noted, quote, recall proceedings would be instituted against you, the governor, at once, end quote. Uh, this was a common sort of refrain. And of course, the brutal execution style murder of Sid Hatfield and Ed Chambers on the uh, courthouse steps in Welch on August 1st pushed miners uh, over the top. The state had finally crossed the line and their language got more blunt. Uh, the men of local 2973 in Turkey, Knob Fayette County, criticized Morgan's quote, arrogant action and to put an end to the reign of terror that now exists in the state, end quote. Uh, locals meeting in Alcott in Kanawha County drafted a letter to Morgan telling him to, to stop, quote, killing innocent people for upholding union labor and to remove these Baldwin Feltz thugs and all of our guard systems from the state. Um, Morgan consistently wrote letters back to the miners and union leaders saying that uh, he was doing all he could to protect law and order. Um, but many began at this time to obviously call uh, his, his words foolhardy. Uh, writing on August 15th, 1921, just before the miners' march commenced, uh, men of local 3773 in Fayette County uh, wanted and made their demands specific even more. They wanted an end to the state police shooting into running automobiles and endangering life on public highways. And they also protested the biased coverage of the strike by the two major Charleston newspapers and demanded that the truth be published for the people. As we also know, while the miners were criticizing the governor, the coal barons wanted to make sure their pro uh, property was protected. I have to read this next quote, it's a little longer, but it, it is so illuminating at, at what's happening just before the miners march takes place. Carl Schultz of the Raleigh Wyoming Coal Company told Jackson Arnold of the state police that he expected the state police to work for them when this eventual labor war erupted, quote, in view of the general objection to privately paid sheriffs, let that sink in for a second. And as large taxpayers, I feel that the state must take care of the police powers instead of depending upon corporations to do it. And I would like to hear from you very promptly what you will do to maintain law and order in the community. Obviously his view of the situation differed from what the miners were saying. And I know Chuck will talk more, uh, Chuck Keene will talk more about this, but just to show you some of the key uh, locations of the, the march that began uh, from Marmette uh, on August 24th 
Uh, miners had very clear goals as we've laid out. Uh, they wanted the end of martial law. They wanted the end of the private guard system. Uh, they wanted to have Governor Morgan impeached. They wanted uh, you know, better press coverage. Uh, and of course they wanted to overthrow Don Chafin's dictatorial hold. As the miners began marching, uh, they picked up support from the nearby Kanawha and New River coal fields, but from miners throughout the state and the wider region. Uh, people continued to write to the governor criticizing that there needed to be uh, larger investigations and action on his part. Uh, one labor leader in Charleston uh, called Morgan the chief representative of the non-resident coal operators. Uh, and basically made the analogy that he was trying to help Loganize all of, uh, of Southern West Virginia. It became even more clear, uh, even as the battle was getting close, that uh, Sheriff Chafin was getting direct assistance from the state police, uh, who provided him with a detachment of deputies uh, to join Chafin's volunteer army of about 3,000. Uh, one group of state police would actually be involved in a key event in the uh, escalation of violence on August the 27th. Uh, when they moved on uh, Beach Creek near the town of Sharples, near Blair. It, when trying to arrest some armed miners, they recklessly uh, got into a, a scuffle with armed miners, uh, during which two Union men were killed. This raid led many miners who had actually started to turn around and go back after Frank Keeney had given this sort of passionate speech uh, to the miners, uh, to head back towards Blair. Of course, uh, this is where the the battle will take place. Uh, miners thus felt no compunction about cutting telephone lines and, and telegraph lines in uh, hijacking CNO trains to move men around the area. Uh, if the force, private forces, the coal operators could work with uh, the elected state, rep state and county representatives to abuse authority, then why can't the miners to a certain point do that as well? Um, I think that makes some logical sense. Um, I'll leave uh, to the battle itself to Chuck Keeney because that's that uh, he is the by far the more superior person to talk about that. Uh, but just to end, um, and I'll wrap up my remarks, uh, after the fighting ended, criticism of the state government continued. And I just have a, a couple of uh, illustrative quotes. A Logan County miner, C. Doss, wrote Governor Morgan, urging to finally do an investigation, an impartial investigation of Logan County quote, run by a bunch of outlaws and the people of that county is getting tired of their way of running business, end quote. Um, most miners had given up hope that the county or state government would do anything. And unfortunately, they also lost hope that the federal troops who came in uh, and even federal government officials would do anything. A group of desperate miners who were former veterans of World War I desperately wrote President Warren Harding asking for the federal troops basically to stay since, quote, there is no law in West Virginia for the workers, end quote. Um, and of course, this will, you know, in, initiate a, a decade or so of decline for union membership and a uh, declining condition for the miners' uh, communities. So thank you for your time, and I'll, I'll wrap things up there. Thank you so much, Hal. That was really informative and interesting. Um, so let me introduce our second speaker, um, uh, Dr. Chuck Keeney. Uh, Chuck Keeney is the great grandson of labor leader Frank Keeney and holds a doctorate in history from WVU. He is currently associate professor of history at Southern West, Southern West Virginia Community and Technical College. And he is a founding member of the West Virginia Mine Wars Museum. Keeney also served as president of the historic preservation group Friends of Blair Mountain. His latest book, The Road to Blair Mountain, Saving a Mine Wars Battlefield from King Cole, details the successful efforts that, of that group to preserve and protect the Blair Mountain battlefield. Uh, thank you, Chuck. Thank you, Lori. And also uh, thank you to the West Virginian Regional History Collection uh, and the archives for uh, having me and for doing this event and focusing on Blair Mountain at this, you know, centennial year that we're having. And I would also like to thank all of you who braved yet another Zoom event. I know if you're as weary as I am of Zoom, I know how that can be. But thank you for your patience and for being here. So, 
before I begin, I always like to uh, bring a couple of plugs here. Uh, I always want to promote the West Virginia Mine Wars Museum in Matewan. You can visit the website at wvminewars.org. Uh, this is the uh, place where you can find a lot of the artifacts connected to the Mine Wars. We just expanded and moved into a new space uh, the previous year, but we were not able to really have it open to the public due to the pandemic, but it is now open to the public. And the Mine Wars uh, Museum is also the facilitator and the main organizer of the Blair Centennial Celebration, which you can find more information at, at Blair100.com. This is gonna be a huge event over Labor Day weekend, four days of events. I believe right now there are somewhere in the neighborhood of 30 separate events taking place in seven different counties and three different states. So go to Blair100.com and check out all the different events that you can see. There's a schedule of events. Uh, I'm gonna be around in many of them. I believe I'm scheduled to talk in three or four events. I'm not really sure, but I'm supposed to talk in a number of events that are taking place there, as well as give a walking tour of Mate One on Sunday night. And there will be a, a big event at Blair on Labor Day uh, that is gonna be sponsored by the United Mine Workers. So. With those little plugs aside, let's get into it. You're looking at Blair Mountain right there uh, in its contemporary state. Uh, that picture was taken by Kenny King. And Kenny King is one of the heroes of the preservation efforts around Blair Mountain. It was Kenny King who was one of the first individuals or maybe the first individual to go up on the battlefield and begin collecting artifacts from the battlefield. And uh, he, it's through his efforts that we even have a Mine Wars Museum and really that Blair Mountain is on the National Register of Historic Places because he was the first one to go up there, begin gathering things and begin to give us the first glimpses of what was actually happening on Blair Mountain. And that's something that we're gonna talk about here today is what happened. Now, over the last 10 years, uh, 10 years ago, we had a, a week long protest march to preserve the Blair Mountain battlefield. And I was one of the organizers of that protest march. And over that time period, I've given a lot of talks, interviews, podcasts, documentaries, and everything else regarding Blair Mountain and the mine wars. So after 10 years of giving a lot of talks and doing a lot of interviews, it, Sometimes I, uh, when I do a new talk, I try to not repeat myself and try to find something that I haven't previously said about Blair Mountain. What can I say that I haven't already said? And I, I've talked about it in terms of the modern labor movement. I've talked about it in terms of environment. I've talked about it in terms of West Virginia identity, in terms of uh, uprisings in post-World War I, but today what we're going to do is I'm going to talk to you about the organization of the Armed March on Logan and the Battle of Blair Mountain itself, specifically the role of union leadership in what was happening. And the reason that I'm going to focus on that is a couple of reasons. There's been some controversy in the past. People have asked questions about who was leading the miners, who uh, made the plans? Was this a spontaneous uprising? Did the miners just kind of lead themselves? And the reason that these things are, are, are important is because one of the ways in which the media and the coal industry wanted to diminish the significance of the event and downplay it is to paint this event as a riot, as uh, out of control, backward, uncivilized hillbillies that were stirred up by outsiders. Uh, so it, it was painted in, in, in such a way as to be detrimental to the identity of the people of the region and add to, not create, but kind of add to and foster the stereotypes that are uh, so, you know, so that Appalachia is so known for. But if we find out that it's an organized event, then that kind of goes against that grain of the wild mountain savage hillbilly stereotype out there. And I think that's important that we be able to establish that. And what I'm going to be sharing with you today is information that in many cases, in many ways, I've not shared before. And this is information that I've gotten through oral histories, through interviewing Frank Keeney's surviving children whenever they were alive, uh, his grandchildren, 
and also Bill Blizzard Jr., uh, the, the son of Bill Blizzard, and also the remaining children of Fred Mooney. Fred Mooney's, uh, believe it or not, has three surviving sons uh, that were very young when he died, and I was able to interview all of them a couple of years ago, as well as children and grandchildren of some other key organizers at the time, one of which is Lawrence Peggy Dwyer. And uh, we were able to do some of these interviews because of the existence of the Mine Wars Museum. The Mooney family, for example, came to West Virginia from Indiana and uh, just to see the museum. And their family had not been in West Virginia for many, many decades. And they came back and I took the opportunity to interview them and get their memories. And we even had a little reunion with the Keeney family and Mooney family and we filmed a, a uh, a, a whole interview session with both families sharing their memories of the two labor leaders. So because of the museum, we've been able to add information. Not, not only are we telling the story, but we're adding to the story. We're building a larger and more complete narrative. And I want to try to share some of those things with you that we've learned passed down through oral histories. And why are oral, oral histories so significant when we're talking about the mine wars? Well, it's significant because we don't have a lot of evidence. Now, I could talk to you about the causes of the Battle of Blair Mountain, but uh, Hal did a really good job in giving you a lot of context into how the government and the companies were working together. Many of you that are watching right now, I'm sure are very familiar with the mine guard system, with the company town system, so I don't need to go into all of that. I'll leave you here with a... Um, piece of script. This is on display at the West Virginia Mine Wars Museum. And as you can see, it says good for one loaf bread. They didn't want to spend money on the word of apparently, but uh, this was uh, from Logan County. And uh, I write about this in my book. It's uh, one of my favorite pieces of script that we have at the museum. And I, I like it so much because it dictates what the miner himself would have been able to buy. It's not just that you're not being paid in American money, you're being dictated to what specifically you can purchase. And when you see this object, it kind of crystallizes the grievances of the miners. You begin to see their anger. And because you can imagine what you may think if your employer handed you something like this on your payday. So without going into all the different details of the causes of the uprising, you can just look at the object and begin to get a, uh, a picture of what was happening in the, in the West Virginia coal fields. So anyway, there's, there's not a lot of written evidence of what was actually happening at the Battle of Blair Mountain, as well as the organization of it. And this is for several reasons. Number one, the miners kept to a code of silence about what was going on. And this was because the, the leadership and the UMWA could have been legally implicated in what was going on and uh, lawyers in the state could go after the UMWA more directly if they were able to tie the UMWA to a conspiracy surrounding the Battle of Blair Mountain. So miners kept to a code of silence about the leadership, about what was going on, and about what happened. And many of them kept a code of silence throughout the course of their lives. Even I found it difficult at first getting some people to talk to me, my family, uh, at the beginning. Uh, and it took a while to even get my own family to open up about uh, the mine wars and about Frank Keeney. And uh, it was difficult at first to get other folks to talk to me. And I had to tell them who I was and my lineage in order for them to open up to me. So even children and grandchildren of participants in the ba battle have been reluctant to talk about it because of that code of silence. So you have that aspect of it. You also have the aspect of it uh, that, as I have said um, in testimony before the West Virginia Surface Mine Board in court when we were trying to defend the battlefield, one of the reasons why uh, preserving the battlefield itself is so significant is you can't study the Battle of Blair Mountain like you would study, say, the Battle of Gettysburg or Yorktown or, I don't know, the Battle of Midway, uh, even something like that. Because with those types of battles, you have letters from soldiers, you have diaries, you have dispatches and correspondence going back and forth between military personnel, between officers. You don't have that at Blair Mountain. They weren't, there wasn't a paper trail. There was only one piece of paper evidence that I'll talk about in just a moment. 
but you didn't have a paper trail. In addition, uh, coal companies themselves, Don Chafin's side was very secretive about a lot of the things that they were doing up there and they helped try to mute uh, a lot of the press. Boyd and Sparks, a World War I correspondent that came to Logan County to cover the Battle of Blair Mountain, was shot in the leg by state troopers and held in prison by Don Chapin's forces. And they edited his story before they allowed him to send it out uh, to, uh, to his publisher. So there's not a lot of written evidence to tell us specifically what was going on up there. And that's why preserving the place itself is so significant because archeology span then becomes very crucial to understanding what happened there. And I've got a couple of pictures here. You can see uh, one of the bullets uh, close up on, on, on the left here. And if you look on the right, you will see Kenny King with the strap around there. And Dr. Harvard Ayers, uh, who's now Professor Emeritus of Archeology span at Appalachian State University. Uh, Kenny King was eventually able to get in touch with Harvard and the two of them in 2006 and then later in 2009 did uh, some work on Blair Mountain, up on Blair and up on Crooked Creek Gap and on Mill Creek. And you can see them there uh, before all the shell casings that, that they found in one single area. Finding these types of, uh, uh, of artifacts, shell casings, guns, what they tell us is they tell us where the fighting was going on, how intense it was. You can know the difference between the caliber of rifles that the miners were, were carrying versus what the company's forces were carrying. You know, the state troopers were armed with Tommy guns, and we found Tommy gun bullets at various places. And you find uh, 30-06s sixes and you know, everything from uh, just little hunting rifles and even muzzle loaders, examples uh, of those that are found on the miners' side. And you can definitely see the difference between uh, the type of weapons that the two had. But you can tell where the fighting was taking place. You can see how close quarter it was. And we can also potentially see how deep the miners penetrated into uh, the, the opposing lines. However, despite the fact that all of this, has, uh, this helps, Less than 25% of the entire battlefield has ever been studied by professional archaeologists. One of the goals that Friends of Blair Mountain and the Mine Wars Museum uh, have, uh, working in conjunction with one another and perhaps with others down the road, is that we hope to get a full archaeological survey of the battlefield. There are barriers to that right now as coal companies uh, and absentee landowning companies like Western Pocahontas, United Affiliates, um, Arkland, and uh, National Resource, Natural Resource Partners are some of the major absentee landowners in that area. And they own the bulk of the land on the battlefield. And they, for whatever reason, aren't very uh, enthusiastic about us going up there and uh, finding out what happened at Blair Mountain, specifically since they worked so hard to try to blow up the site to begin with. But until we get a full view of it, we, we won't know real details about some of the fighting that was taking place along some of the lines. So archaeology is helpful, but what we know now still leaves us with an incomplete picture. And so what does that kind of lead us to? Well, it, it leads us to having to depend upon some of these oral histories. Now, of course, sometimes you have to take oral histories with a grain of salt. It deals with people's memories. Maybe things get altered over time. Nonetheless, in many ways, the story of the mine wars kind of was passed down in this way from one generation to the next. And it's kind of been that uh, kind of oral tradition that kept the history alive until, you know, the later part of the 20th century and the early 21st century, when you begin to see a revival and more academic work that really begins to study the mind war. So this oral history tradition has been crucial. And so I'm going to be relying on this. And of course, like I said, with oral histories, uh, with people's memories, you know, it, it's not a 100% certain certainty that everything is accurate, but we have to take what we can get and make the best of it from there. So let's look at some of these things. So that's my great grandfather. That's Frank Keeney. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the leadership that was going on here. 
Now, there are several people that I'm going to talk about. Frank Keeney, uh, who was uh, president of the Union in West Virginia of District 17. He was also president of the West Virginia Federation of Labor at the time of the Battle of Blair Mountain, which he served uh, in that capacity until 1924. You also have Bill Blizzard. You have Fred Mooney, who was secretary treasurer. You have Bill Petrie, who was vice president of the Union local of uh, the district. And uh, there were several other characters involved. Harold Houston, who was the lead counsel for the UMWA. He was also uh, twice uh, ran for governor on the socialist ticket. Frank Keeney was also a socialist, so was Fred Mooney. Uh, and, and there were others that I'm going to mention throughout here. But of course, I'm going to focus a little bit on my great grandfather uh, because of his prominent role. Uh, let me give you a little background on him while we're before we get into the actual Battle of Blair Mountain itself. Frank Kinney was born in 1882 on the Ides of March, the exact same year that the world's first coal-fired power plant debuted in New York City. Thomas Edison, by the way, invented the coal-fired power plant. A lot of people don't know that. They're, he's known, of course, for the invention of the light bulb, but uh, his invention of the coal-fired power plant to get electricity to his light bulbs um, maybe every bit as significant as the uh, light bulb invention. And then certainly the coal-fired power plant not only helped build industrial America, but of course, as we now, now know, has altered the, the environment and the climate of our entire planet. So the same year that Frank Kinney was born along Cabin Creek in 1882, we have a transformative event happening that's going to uh, fuel industrialization and change the landscape of the entire planet. So, Shortly after Frank Keeney was born, the family lost their land. Uh, the Keeney family lost uh, between two and 3,000 acres of land along Cabin Creek. Uh, some of that land became the town of Eskdale. If you uh, recall Howell's uh, PowerPoint earlier, he showed a picture of Eskdale in 1912. Eskdale was carved out of Keeney family land. And the very first mayor of Eskdale was James Keeney, in fact. Well, the other half became coal company property and there's, some fuzziness about how the family lost the property, but Frank Keeney's father died before he was two years old, and the family lost the property very shortly after that. Uh, he may have been, family may have been run off. Uh, I know that it wasn't bought specifically uh, from them, but uh, Frank Keeney remained very bitter about the fact that his family land was taken from him, and this was also holds true for the Blizzard family, who also were landowners in the area. And so the Keeney family and the Blizzard family, of course, played really significant roles early on in the Paint Creek, Cabin Creek strike. And among the other things that motivated these individuals to do what they did, the fact that they had lost their family lands also plays into this and personalizes uh, the struggle for these individuals beyond everything else, the company town system, the mine guards and all that. Frank Keeney worked as a trap boy in the mines. He only went to the sixth grade in school. After that, he became more self-educated. Um, he nearly died in the mines a couple of times. One of the more memorable events is after a, a, a shaft uh, collapse, uh, a, a mule nearly crushed him, pushing him up against a wall. This is when he was around 12. He bit the mule's ear off in order for the uh, mule to let him go. And um, as I've said before, my grandmother has always said that that was perfectly indicative of uh, his personality. He was more stubborn than a mule, quite literally. And it's part of the stubbornness or resilience, or as uh, Fred Mooney wrote of Frank Keeney in his autobiography, Frank Keeney was all fire and dynamite. He asked for and showed no quarter. That's what Mooney wrote of him. And others talked about him in these kind of larger than life terms. Winthrop Lane said that there is the suggestion of the tiger in Keeney's personality. You uh, expect to be seized and torn when he speaks to you. Uh, and there were others that said that he, Keeney was the embodiment of the union spirit and purpose in West Virginia. Um, you also had, when I was growing up, I would have old people come up to my father and shake my father's hand and, and say things like, I saw Frank Keeney speak once. I shook Frank Keeney's hand once. I uh, 
uh, I fought with Frank Keeney on Cabin Creek, and they were talking about him in these incredibly reverent terms. It's one of the things that really fascinated me and got me so involved in the mine wars history to begin with, because I was, I was seeing examples of elderly people come up to my father and speak about my great grandfather as though he was some kind of great hero and yet nobody had ever heard of him and nobody had ever heard of the mine wars my eighth grade west virginia studies teacher had never even heard of the mine wars when i took it and uh that was the case for you know my friends my uh, and everybody that i knew when i was growing up so there was a war with no monuments with uh no public memory and yet there were people coming up to my family members and talking about this man as though he was some kind of larger than life individual. And it's one of the things that really intrigued me about him. Nonetheless, uh, he becomes a union leader in the Paint Creek Cabin Creek strike. He was one of, he was the second family uh, to be evicted from their homes along Cabin Creek when the strike began. The first family was by the way, Frank Keeney's father-in-law was uh, the first family to be uh, taken out. And his father-in-law was another uh, radical that uh, very few people know about, but we don't really have time to get into that today. I'm trying to keep things short. I tend to ramble on a little bit when I talk about all of these things. So I'm trying to crystallize and, not, and, and condense things a little bit. So Keeney, uh, he became this leader during the Pink Creek Cabin Creek strike. They were evicted, he was living in the tent. Whenever uh, uh, things were getting rough, uh, he had three kids there uh, in the tent and his wife was pregnant uh, with uh, what would be their uh, third daughter, Geraldine Keeney. I interviewed Geraldine uh, before her death, but she was born uh, in the tent colony uh, in 1912. But it was during that time period when his kids were sick and the tent colony and his wife, Bessie, was pregnant that he went to Charleston and asked the union leadership for more help when they wouldn't give it to them. He decided or he said and proclaimed that he would assume control of the strike himself. And he also then sought out Mother Jones and brought Mother Jones to Cabin Creek. And after that, the strike took a very violent turn. He would uh, go on along with Fred Mooney to lead the miners in this strike uh, to uh, some gains and some victories that they would make along Pink Creek and Cabin Creek. After this, they would, uh, Keeney would become district president and Mooney would become secretary treasurer. And the two of these individuals would be the ones that were really spearheading the union movement. Uh, and of course, Bill Petrie and Bill Blizzard were also involved, but Blizzard was a lot younger than Keeney and Mooney by about 10 years. He was only a teenager whenever the Pink Creek Cabin Creek strike was taking place. Uh, so uh, he was a bit younger at the time. I'm going to get into Blizzard's role here in just a moment. But um, Kinney uh, really spearheads this movement. By the way, here are some of his personal effects that you can see on display at the Mine Wars Museum. Uh, if you see the book right there, the book is a book of poems that Frank Kinney kept with him in his tent in the tent colony, 1912-1913, uh, and he would read poems for inspiration. He tried to be self-educated, and he tried to read as much as he could, even though he only went to the sixth grade in school, and uh, it has passages that he underlined and notes that he made uh, in the book. That book was passed down to me, and it's now on display at the, at the Mind Wars Museum, as well as his knife, razor, and a pocket watch that he had later in life. Uh, last week, in fact, I was giving a, a personal tour of the museum to uh, the United Mine Workers President Cecil Roberts. We had a ceremony down there for, uh, for the UMWA uh, with Local 1440. And Cecil was down there and uh, I was giving him a tour of the museum. He had been to the, the first version of the museum, but he hadn't been to the new one. And I was taking him around and I was showing him these, uh, these artifacts and, and uh, showed him the knife. And I said, you know, who knows, Frank Keeney may have stabbed a mine guard with this knife. And Cecil looked at me and said, we can only hope. So uh, you can see some of the, the feelings uh, that uh, the anti-company feelings still resonate even today. Nonetheless, uh, Keeney and Mooney would be 
these enormous leaders that would spearhead everything that was going on. Which is ultimately is going to get us to the Battle of Blair Mountain and the, and the march. And so I want to talk about that. First of all, in order to understand what was going on in 1921, you need to understand that this wasn't the first intended march. That's the first thing that we need to understand. In fact, during the Paint Creek, Cabin Creek strike, there was almost a march. On September the 1st, 1912, that is when somewhere in the neighborhood of 3,000 to 5,000 miners uh, gathered along the Canal River, uh, just north of Cabin Creek, and their intent was to march through Paint Creek and Cabin Creek and uh, drive out the mine guards by force. Uh, as they began to amass, however, Governor Glasscock, as Hal pointed out, declared martial law the following day on September the 2nd, 1912, and rushed in somewhere in the neighborhood of 1,200 uh, state militia to uh, prevent the miners' march from taking place. So it was almost a march during the Paint Creek, Cabin Creek strike, but the quick declaration of martial law put a stop to that. And by the way, we don't know a whole lot of details about the internal workings of that, but by this time, uh, Keeney and Mooney were firmly in charge of the strike, and uh, we know that they were heavily involved in everything that was happening at that moment. So they were likely heavily involved in the organization of this very first march, but that wasn't the, but that wasn't the only one. A few years later in 1919, right after World War I in September, there was nearly a march that would have potentially ended up in a 1919 battle of Blair Mountain. And this is when miners began to assemble at Marmette. And several thousand of them, somewhere around 4,000 of them assembled at Marmette with intent to march south um, under the uh, notion that Union organizers were being killed and uh, the brutal treatment of men and women on strike uh, in the strike zone. And, and uh, these rumors were coming out of Logan County and Mingo and McDowell County, uh, the three counties that had yet to be unionized. Now, Frank Kinney and Fred Mooney wanted the public to think that this was a spontaneous event that the miners themselves organized. And one of the things that they did in order to bring that home is just as the miners began to assemble at Lens Creek, Kinney and Mooney went to Fairmont, and uh, which obviously is uh, 120 miles away. And they go to Fairmont and say they're having, you know, a, uh, a meeting with union locals up there just as miners begin to assemble. When um, Cornwell, Governor Cornwell, telegrams uh, Frank Keeney and, uh, in Fairmont and says, miners are assembling, what's going on? You need to intervene. Keeney, uh, you know, sends a message back to him and says, I have no idea what's going on. Uh, that's completely out of my hands. And, it, and it's, they obviously knew what was going on. In fact, they picked the spot and, and uh, many of the miners were following a directive. And I'm gonna get back in how we know that in, in a moment. But uh, eventually Keeney and Mooney come back to Charleston. They go with the governor to uh, where the miners were. The governor promises that he'll personally look into the conditions that were going on with the mine guards and, and in Logan County and in Mingo County and McDowell County. Uh, the miners then agree to disperse. Now a handful of the miners do actually march a little bit of the way towards there, but this ends up getting called off too. Now, now this 1919 march is very significant. It's very significant because we know several things that were happening here. First, as the miners were assembling in Marmette in, in 1919, Don Chafin was already preparing a defense of Logan County. And he was already preparing a defense along the ridge lines extending from Blair Mountain all the way up Spruce Fork Ridge and all the way north to Mill Creek. Now, what you're looking at right now is a topographical map of the Blair Mountain battlefield. If you can follow my little mouse thing here, you can see that 
uh, this area right here is the battlefield, or this is the part of the battlefield that is currently listed on the National Register of Historic Places. That's 1,669 acres, and it stretches for a little over 12 miles. Blair Mountain itself is down here in the square of the bottom right of the screen. Okay, that's Blair Mountain itself. If you look up here just to north, there's the town of Blair. This is Spruce Fork Ridge, Crooked Creek Gap, and all the way up to Mill Creek. Now, when people think of the Battle of Blair Mountain, they often just think of Blair Mountain, but the battle was much larger than Blair Mountain itself. As you can see, Blair Mountain itself was actually only a small portion of the actual battlefield. It extended much further. And the reason this was going to be the area where fighting was going to take place was because if you know the geography of this area, Spruce Fork Ridge and Blair Mountain and all the way up through uh, Crooked Creek, there's just a, almost like a natural fortress of ridges that comes up through here. And it's the perfect place to mount a defense. And this was obviously a few miles north of Logan. Logan is a few miles down here this way. It was the perfect place to defend the area. So Chafin began putting entrenchments in place and setting up machine gun emplacements in September 1919. They already knew that this was the place that they were going to defend. They had already set up their defensive emplacements at this time. And they used many of these same entrenchments and same defensive positions in 1921. Why is that significant? It's significant because both the co-operator side and the miners knew that if they were going to do another march, that this is the place where the fight was going to be. And miners are, uh, the miner side is going to know through reconnaissance that was taking place on the ground in this area, and I'll get into that in a second, that they knew where the defensive entrenchments were going to be. All of that is significant because if this was going to be a spontaneous uprising, uh, that's not very good planning on, on, on the uh, side of the union leadership. If you know where a battle is going to take place and you know where your enemy is going to be, you're probably going to make a plan for when you get there. The miners did not arrive at Blair Mountain and then decide what to do. They knew where they were going and they knew what they were going to do well before they arrived there. And they had to because Chafin already had his defensive entrenchments set up. These were not just put up in 1921. They already knew where they were going to defend in 1919. So the union leaders had time to prepare for what was going to happen and they did. How did they find out where all the entrenchments were taking place? Well, they found out through an unlikely source. And this is something that I know only from my family and from a few other sparse uh, oral histories that uh, the people that I've talked to. And the unlikely source is Devil Lance Hatfield. Some of you may be asking, what on earth does Devil Lance Hatfield have to do with the West Virginia Mine Wars. Well, more than what you might think. Devil Ants had moved into Logan County after the feud, after they lost their land and sold it off to outside investors and the land would, uh, part of the land would ultimately become the town of Matewan. They moved to Island Creek in Logan, which is just a few miles south of Blair, um, a little southeast of Blair. Uh, but they were uh, the Hatfield lands the homestead, so to speak, was there. And that's where Devil Lance and his kids lived, uh, his grown children. Some of them lived there also. And they had kind of almost like a fortress area that, uh, that they kind of defended from outsiders. Well, at any rate, Hatfield, who didn't die until 1921, as early as 1918, he becomes a, a union sympathizer. Now, I really don't know the reasons for why he becomes a union sympathizer. Um, he may have been upset about the fact that the Hatfields lost their land to outside corporations. That may be part of it. He may have been just sympathetic with their general aims or the way miners were being treated. Or it may have just been that he hated Don Chapin's guts. Uh, that's another uh, possibility. His uh, Two of his sons 
had had a number of run-ins with Don Chafin and his men uh, regarding prohibition. Uh, Don Chafin had shut down some uh, moonshine operations that some of Devalance's sons and a speakeasy that Devalance's uh, sons were trying to operate in Logan County. Don Chafin didn't do this because he was a man who upheld the law. Don Chafin did this so that he could sell his own moonshine and have his own speakeasy, which he did in Logan. That speakeasy is still there, by the way. It's underneath the bowling alley, or at least the place where it was. But anyway, the uh, so whether it was distaste for Don Chafin or union sympathies or being upset for the lost family land absentee corporations, we don't know. But we do know that he was helping out smuggle union officials into Logan County. They were able to stay with the Hatfields and then from there be dispersed throughout Logan and Mingo County to go organize. And I know this from Frank Kenny's children who have told me the story many times uh, because Frank Kenny himself was smuggled there by the Hatfields into Logan County many times. And the Hatfields were the ones that were scouting out the area and giving the Union information on where Don Chafin and his forces were putting their entrenchments, where the machine guns were going to be, and how many men that they were going to have. I know that Frank Kenny and Devil Lance Hatfield knew one another, and uh, that Frank Kenny stayed with Devil Lance on a couple of occasions. I know that when Frank Kenny was in Logan County, uh, they, by the way, they used a series of light signals with lamps and horses uh, on mountain passes to get into the county. They didn't take trains or main roads to get into the county. Anyway, uh, while he was in Logan, in Logan County, I should say, Devil Ants sent some of his grandchildren, who were, you know, almost grown men at this time also, to Frank Kinney's house in Charleston, and they guarded his house whenever he was away. And uh, both Elaine and Geraldine, two of Frank Kinney's daughters that I interviewed, said that they vividly remember being uh, alone when, when their father was away and the Hatfields there at the house guarding the house. Uh, Geraldine had a wonderful story of always saying, looking out her bedroom window and seeing a Hatfield with a, with a rifle over his shoulder spitting tobacco juice on the yard at, at nighttime uh, because Frank Kinney had so many death threats. And he was very worried about his, his family. His wife, Bessie, always uh, slept with a handgun underneath her pillow. I have uh, that, that handgun is still in the family, by the way. Bessie, by the way, was supposed to be a better shot than Frank Keeney, from what I've been told in my family. They said that she could, she could shoot down a, a line of 10 cans on a, uh, on a fence with ease. But anyway, um, this is how they were able to find out a lot uh, of the information about where the defensive entrenchments were going to be, where that was going to take place. And I know I'm kind of really pushing my luck with time here, but I'm going to try to get through some things um, quickly about that. Now, why? Now, this is important. Once the once the march gets going, uh, perhaps I should back up for a second and, and and talk a little bit about the events leading up to it. We know, of course, on August the first, uh, first Chambers and Hatfield were uh, were were assassinated uh, on the footsteps of the McDowell County Courthouse. A week later, on August the seventh, August first is when they were they were killed. On August the seventh, they have this rally at the Capitol in which uh, Frank Kinney tells the miners that the only way you can get your rights is with a high-powered rifle. He then tells them to go home and await the call to march. Two days later, on August the ninth. 1921, we have the uh, evidence of the only piece, the only documentation, the only piece of paper that we have in existence that ties the Union leadership to the march on Blair Mountain. And that is from Harold Houston, who was the defense attorney and the lead counsel for the UMWA. Houston uh, was something of a mentor to Frank Keeney. Uh, they were pretty inseparable. Houston was always there in the union offices. But anyway, a letter from Harold Houston is being sent to the union local in Blair. This is on August the 9th, 1921. And this letter, by the way, this letter was found folded up in a book in an attic in Bill Blizzard's granddaughter's house. Go figure. That's how it was found. But the letter that, that's from Harold Houston uh, is 
is sent to the Union local in Blair and is telling them that guns are going to be arriving soon and that uh, those guns are going to be in preparation or, or for the miners when they get there. Now, what's interesting about this, uh, there, there's several things interesting about this. First of all, this is uh, a full, uh, close to a full two weeks before miners even begin assembling in Marmette. Before, well before they, they begin assembling in Marmette, there's already a letter from the union leadership in Charleston going to Blair, telling them that miners are going to be there and they're already sending guns to that place and ammunition to be there. So well before miners even begin assembling, we have a piece of paper evidence that's, that shows clear intent, clear organization, and the fact that they already know where they're going to be. Blair Mountain was not the objective of the armed march. Uh, the, the, the objective was to get to Mingo County, but they knew that they were going to have to get through this area and they knew where the fight was going to take place before the miners even began to assemble. And we also see this as the events begin to unfold. Uh, eight days after this, Morgan refuses the demands of the miners. They made a number of demands to Governor Morgan on August the 7th uh, and handed them to the governor's office. The governor refused to personally meet with Keeney or Mooney or Mother Jones and Blizzard who were also there. But uh, the Morgan refuses this list of demands, which are things from lifting martial law in Mingo County, getting rid of the mine guard system, et cetera, et cetera. Morgan refuses all these demands and that same evening, Frank Keeney sends dispatches to all the union locals in uh, Kanawha and Fayette County and also on up into Marion County and some of these other, Raleigh County, some of these other counties. He sends dispatches to the union locals with instructions that they are to uh, begin assembling men, gathering the firearms that they can and go to Lens Creek. So we see clearly uh, from, we know this from testimonies that were taking place later from oral histories later that this was taking place, that uh, deputies, uh, not deputies, but organizers that coming straight from Charleston were going to each of the union locals. A lot of these guys that were taking these dispatches were individuals that fought with Keeney and Mooney on Cabin Creek, guys like Brant Scott and uh, Lawrence Peggy Dwyer, Dan Chain, Few Close Johnson, which Hal mentioned uh, earlier. It was kind of that that kind of click of uh, conspirators, leaders, whatever you want to call them, that, 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 that started in Cabin Creek that really played a big central role in organizing what was going on here. And uh, I should also say uh, that Cabin Creek itself would remain a hotbed of uh, strong union activity and union change. It's obviously Pink Creek and Cabin Creek, but also a lot of the leadership uh, that would take place in the Armed March would come from Cabin Creek much later. Of course, uh, the Black Lung Association and the Miners for Democracy movement would all or originate in the Cabin Creek area. And the current UMWA president, Cecil Roberts, also is from Cabin Creek. So there's a lot of connection with Cabin Creek and uh, significant events in UMWA history. But anyway, Keeney, go, uh, Keeney sends out the dispatches. August the 20th, miners begin assembling at Marmette. August the 24th, Mother Jones goes there, gives the telegram. I'm not going to recant the whole telegram incident uh, in which she tries to talk the miners out of going on the march. They don't buy the telegram. They find out that the telegram is fake. The miners continue to march, or they begin marching on August the 24th. August the 27th is an interesting day. This is the day in which Frank Keeney made what is some people call the ballpark speech in which uh, uh, General H.H. H. Bandholtz comes into town and tells Keeney and Mooney that if, the, if they don't get the miners to turn back, then the U.S. Army is going to come in and squash this potential revolt. There were serious concerns out of Washington, uh, as Bandholtz related to them, that this is something that could spread. There's a big worker armed uprising in West Virginia. What if that spreads to other states and it becomes a more general uprising? And Van Holtz told uh, Keeney and Mooney that that was not going to be allowed to happen. And the US Army would do whatever, use whatever force was necessary to put it down if they couldn't stop it. 
Kenny and Mooney then grab, get in a car and they head all the way down to uh, Madison where they catch up with the miners and have a meeting in a ballpark. Now, the, according to the official story, Kenny and Mooney uh, told the miners to turn back and Frank Kenny made a, a, a passionate speech and the miners were then taught to, uh, were then began to turn around and go back. Now, that's the official story. There was not any press that was there at this talk. Uh, there have been other miners that said that Keeney didn't really say that, that he uh, wanted to make it look as though the miners were going to turn back, but really didn't want them to and told them as much. We don't know what actually happened. I have asked my family members about it. I've asked Bill Blizzard Jr. about it. I've asked Fred Mooney's children about it, and I have never gotten a straight answer from any of them about what exactly happened at that ballpark. So we don't know exactly what happened there. What we do know is that after a shootout at Sharples later that night, or Sharpless, as they say in Logan County, they call it Sharpless in Logan. But uh, the, the shootout that took place there at Sharples uh, reinvigorated the march and, and reignited the spark. And uh, by August the 30th, miners began arriving at Blair, but they didn't all just go to Blair. And this is one of the other things that's very significant about what was going on here at the battle. And that is the miners, well before they get to Blair, they split off. Many of them go north, if you can follow the little arrow of, of, the, um, of the mouse here. Many of them split off, actually when they get to Jeffries, many of them split off and head north towards the, the northern section of the defensive entrenchments, while the other main group goes south towards Blair. They did, there are some forces that go up into the middle, but it's not the bulk. The bulk of the fighting of the Battle of Blair Mountain was up here in the northwest flank and down here at the southern flank. Uh, there wasn't, we don't know of tremendous fighting that took place along the middle. However, I should say that with a touch of salt, because none of this area that you see in the middle has been uh, surveyed by archaeologists. It's, a, it's kind of a, a blank space in the historic record. Nonetheless, the bulk of the fighting, though, we do know, took place here in the northern flank and the southern flank, and they split off from each other. And what they were doing is a classic pincer movement. They were trying to roll off the flanks. And you don't have your army separate well before you get to Blair and try to execute a pincer movement and roll back the flanks unless you're highly organized, unless you have a plan beforehand. And that's one of the things that I wanted to get to is that based on the circumstantial evidence, based on uh, what I've been told by the children of both, uh, or uh, of Mooney, Keeney, and Blizzard, the Union leadership in the weeks, maybe even months leading up to the Battle of Blair Mountain already had a plan in place before the, the miners ever took a step away from Marmette. And that's significant. Uh, they already had a plan in place. Bill Blizz, some, according to some narratives, Bill Blizzard uh, kind of spontaneously took over things after Keeney and Mooney left. I'm going to get back to that in a second. But the evidence that I have and from everything that I know, Bill Blizzard was going to lead the, the troops in the field from the very beginning. They knew before they ever left Charleston that Bill Blizzard was going to be the commander in the field. They already had their military plan in place. They already knew where they wanted to go. So that plan was already formulated well before they left. Keeney and Mooney, meanwhile, were going to be the ones who were going to talk to the press. They were going to disavow their involvement in the whole thing and say that this is just the miners being fed up and they have no control over it. And this was to absolve the United Mine Workers from uh, any conspiracy charges. Now, what happened after the ballpark speech? According to Fred Mooney's autobiography and according to the main narrative, Kenny and Mooney leave. They leave the state and hide out in Ohio while the battle commences. But there are other stories. 
Frank Keeney told his children that he was at Blair Mountain. He didn't say that he fought at Blair Mountain. He was at Blair Mountain and he was on the front lines or near the front lines. And he, he said that he was, you know, heard the, heard the gunshots from Blair Mountain and was inspecting the front lines. Now, that may be taken with a grain of salt. Maybe he was just telling that to his children and grandchildren uh, because he wanted, was, just wanted to say that he was a part of it. But let me also say that at Frank Keeney's funeral, there was an individual, an old miner, a couple of old miners actually, that approached my father and my grandfather and some of the other individuals in Keeney's family. And two of them swear that they were with Frank Keeney at Blair Mountain. One of them said he was a kid and carried water for Frank Keeney at Blair Mountain. And my family asked for clarification on that. And they said, are you sure it was at Blair Mountain? They said, yes, I was at Blair Mountain during the battle with Frank Keeney and he was there. We don't have that recorded. We have no paper evidence to show that. Now it's possible that Keeney and Mooney went to the front lines and inspected things and oversaw things for a little bit and then left and went to Ohio after that. But they could not be seen or could not be spotted in or around the battlefield in any way that would make its way into a courtroom or, or the UMWA itself could be liable for what was happening there. And so they took every effort to make sure that they were not seen. Now, how does this change the narrative? It doesn't really change the overall narrative that much. Like I said, Bill Blizzard was always going to be the guy that was in charge uh, of miners in the field because he was lesser known. He wasn't a main union president or one of the main district officials. And because of that, he could kind of slip under the radar. Kenny and Mooney could not uh, have been on the, on the front lines the entire time. Nonetheless, this little bit of information does give us a, a little bit more of an interesting picture of what may or may not have happened there. But my contention from the very beginning, uh, based on circumstantial evidence, oral histories, and the little bit of paper evidence we have, is that the miners' uh, march was something that was planned from the beginning. They knew where they were going to go. They didn't improvise or they didn't do much improvisation. Now, granted, how much control they would have had over an entire army stretched out over 12 miles and every single thing that was going on is, a, of course, a matter of speculation. Even generals uh, in professional militaries that, are, that fight battles that are over that same span of time don't have control over everything. So it's not to say that the union leadership controlled everything that was going on, but they certainly had a plan and they certainly had something ahead of time. And it was the entire union leadership, I believe, Keeney, Mooney, Blizzard, also Harold Houston, and some of these other individuals uh, that played a role in planning out everything that was going to happen. They tried very hard to leave nothing for chance. So they weren't just uh, a bunch of backwoods, uncivilized hillbillies. That's not what we're looking at here. We're looking at an armed uprising, an insurrection that was organized. And an insurrection that was organized because of years, even decades of systematic oppression by an industrial autocracy that existed in West Virginia. Some people think that uh, something like the Battle of Blair Mountain could never happen again, but I urge people to be cautious in that. The wealth gap in the United States is the largest that it's been in a century since the time of the original Battle of Blair Mountain. We have also new union battles taking place, not just here, but around the world. Uh, company towns still exist. They exist in East Africa. They exist in South Africa. They exist in the Congo. They exist in Indonesia. They exist in South America, where corporations can still merge with local governments. And uh, Exxon, Chevron, uh, even um, Chinese companies are hiring out private armed forces to protect company property and company towns, sometimes to forcefully relocate people in all over the developing world. It, 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 it's, it's a fact that these that the, the company town system that was so prevalent here in West Virginia, you can still find that in places in the world today. 
and you can still find violence regarding unionization. In Peru in 2018, for example, over a dozen union leaders were killed, assassinated in one year alone. In 2012, Astoria, Spain, in the northern section coal mining region of Spain, there was violent conflicts. They had a, a strike in which miners made homemade rockets and shot them at, at, at company and police forces. So as I always say, Blair Mountain isn't who we were, it's who we are. And the Battle of Blair Mountain in some ways never really ended, but in some ways is it changed locations and places around the world that are going under similar development that West Virginia and the United States underwent 100 years ago. They're seeing some of those same growing pains and you're seeing some of those same struggles. And unless we learn the, the lessons of Blair Mountain, then perhaps more systematic uh, armed insurrections may happen in the future. Okay, I'm sorry for going so long. Uh, I apologize, uh, but uh, thank you for uh, being patient with me throughout this whole time. Thank you, uh, Chuck, that was absolutely fascinating. Um, we, we went a little long, but we do have some good questions. So if, if folks want to stick around, um, I'll go back up to the chat and um, and pick out some of them. And then um, if people want to ask any live, we'll do that too. Um, the first question that came through was, and either of you can address this. It doesn't, I think either, you know, one or the other uh, can chime in. Can you see any comparisons between the sham government then with bad representation of the miners to the current union representatives with enormous paychecks and seen as in the pocket of the industry rather than truly on the side of the workers? I, I'm, I don't want to defer to Chuck on that one, but maybe, maybe, maybe he has a better answer than I do. I mean, um, well, I would say that uh, that's not the opinion of a number of, of miners that I know. Uh, I, you know, I was just at UMW Local 1440. I have a close relationship with a lot of the miners there, the UMWA miners, and uh, they don't necessarily feel that way about uh, the union leadership. They're extraordinarily loyal uh, to the, the international union leadership now. Um, particularly for the battles that they've done uh, regarding uh, pensions. And uh, Cecil Roberts, um, the current uh, president, uh, there are certainly valid criticisms you could make of choices that have happened over the last 20, 30 years uh, that, have, that have taken place. Uh, he does, though, uh, regularly get arrested. Uh, he was just arrested two weeks ago um, during the Alabama strike, uh, the Met Coal strike there in Alabama. Uh, he was arrested numerous times uh, for civil disobedience whenever they were trying to uh, get pensions uh, uh, and health care plans for reinstated because of the various coal bankruptcies that have been taking place. So uh, I don't know that, that I'm going to say, I'm not going to go as far as to say that they're in, in the same league as the government as the coal industry was, because the, that's a bit much. Uh, the UMWO has always had problems with a bit of corruption. And that's not uh, unique to the UMWA uh, in, in unions, so you do have some of that. So I wouldn't go as far as I wouldn't I wouldn't draw a complete equivalent. There are valid criticisms that could be made, of course, but I would not draw that complete equivalent. Thank you for that answer. <clears throat> for the uh, another uh, question, uh, did the U.S. Army Air Corps and General Billy Mitchell attack? and bomb the miners? Did the US government attack its own citizen at the behest of the mine owners? Mitchell talked a lot about the use of sort of, you know, aerial reconnaissance and, you know, talked a lot to the media before. And I know that, I, I Chuck can probably agree, this is one of the biggest sort of questions that I often have to address that students have. It has a lot of like popular viewpoints uh, Chafin did uh, hire out some planes to do air reconnaissance, and I do believe they dropped, those private planes dropped some ordnance. Thank you. Uh, let me, there's some really good conversation um, in the chat. Um, let me skip down to another one. Um, 
I think this is more for you, um, Chuck, um, since you talked about oral history. Has your oral history research brought more light to the story of women who marched as nurses? Did they have training from World War I service, either military or civilian? That question is about to be answered with a new book that's coming out by Catherine Moore. Uh, Catherine has a, a, she's the, by the way, the board president of the West Virginia Mind Wars Museum, good friend of mine. I've worked with Catherine for many years. She's also an excellent, excellent writer. She has got a, a book that's going to be coming out that is going to focus on the role of women and minorities in the mine wars. And so she's going to be focusing on women. We do, uh, and she knows, she knows it better than I do. So uh, be looking for Catherine's book. It's not going to be out, I think, until early next year but uh, she was hoping that it would be done by the end of this year, but apparently uh, that's not happening. So, but it's gonna be out early next year and uh, hopefully you'll get it and you can find much more about that. I, I don't know specifics about how uh, well-trained they were or not, but I know that there were of course women that set up field hospitals and brought food. That's sounds, I mean, um, I've, Catherine's been here to the center and researched many times, and um, I look forward to, to reading the book, and that's a fascinating um, aspect of the story that needs to be told. Um, another question, um, are there any concerted efforts to provide information to the West Virginia Department of Ed with information about this? albeit in an age-appropriate format, to improve the education of West Virginia school students on the true and actual history of the mine wars? I, I would recommend that you read chapter five of my book, uh, in which I talk about the systematic efforts to keep that out of our classrooms uh, from the 1920s all the way to the present. That, and there has been a systematic effort. We've got a paper trail and uh, I, you can read chapter five and, and see why uh, going to the West Virginia Department of Education is uh, kind of like going to Don Blankenship and asking him to help you with your black lung. So uh, that's not exactly, uh, you're not gonna have a lot there. However, if you go to the West Virginia Mind Wars Museum website, you will find curriculum and lesson plans for fourth graders, eighth graders, and 11th graders. It's free and accessible. And our, our museum uh, staff and board members, and so we brought in some other people to help with that. So we have uh, stuff there for teachers to use. And a lot of students and, and schools have brought children to the Mine Wars Museum. Uh, and uh, we give out bandanas to all the kids. And so more and more, uh, teachers are enthusiastic about it, but not so much from the state. Uh, and again, read my book and you can find out very clearly why that is so. Thank you. Uh, one more from the chat and just circling back to the um, uh, Billy Mitchell um, and the um, United States Army. Um, did the president send Billy Mitchell with U.S. Army airplanes and ordnance? I've heard that fragments of military bombs have been found. Was the military of the United States present? Well, yes and no. Uh, as far as fragments of, of bombs, they may be bombs uh, from Chafin's forces. Uh, I've not seen any fragments of bombs um, myself, and uh, I've seen a lot of artifacts connected to the Battle of Blair Mountain. I've not, I've not seen anything like that. Uh, there was a colonel uh, that was with Chafin that was really handling the defenses. It's often called Don Chafin's army, but he didn't really plan the defenses. A guy named Colonel Eubanks was in charge. Uh, so there was uh, U.S. military personnel there that was helping to direct the defense, but in a, an official capacity, U.S. troops did not show up until September the 4th is when they arrived, and that's when miners put down their guns. Okay, thank you. Um, well, we're at 11.40, um, and so I think we'll conclude, but I want to thank both Dr. Corby and Dr. Keeney for uh, their wonderful presentations today. Um, enlightening on this topic and um, 
giving us, I think, some new areas to, um, to research and to think about. Uh, we, this is being recorded and we do plan to make it available uh, through the library's website. So um, we'll be sharing that with you and you can share it with others. Uh, thanks uh, again for your um, attendance today and happy Juneteenth and happy West Virginia Day. Have a great weekend. Thanks everyone. Sorry for being so long-winded. <laughs>